now to the wall of Skinwalker Ranch, which has gotten a lot of discussion in the last couple of years. Uh, Bob Bigelow is the main character who bought Skinwalker Ranch. And the reason that he bought the ranch was because of a bunch of weird things that were happening at the ranch. The one story tells that uh, the wife of the, uh, that was at the Skinwalker Ranch goes and buys groceries, comes back to the house, puts the groceries into the way, leaves the bags on the cupboard, and comes back after a couple minutes and all the groceries are back in the bag. The other incident that's famously told, and there are many of them, is the one with the four, four bulls that disappear. And the ranch owner finds them in a locked trailer. And so it's things like this that create this curiosity. The phenomena creates a very curious phenomena. And Bob Bigelow, who has the money and the interest from his own experiences, decides he's going to buy the ranch. And this is how the phenomena gets the word out. When Bob Bigelow was asked, what was it, the whole Skinwalker thing about for the years that he owned it? He answered immediately, it's all about messaging. So it's about games and gaming and messaging in our case. We never had anybody hurt on the property that was hurt, hurt because of these events. So what was it all about? It was games. There was instructions through participating games that we would set up and we would verify the controls on those games. So basically he's saying that this was messaging. This is why these things were happening at, at Skinwalker Ranch. And this fits into the theory of wow. It gets you curious, you start looking into it and you realize the world is not the world you thought it was. There's been a bunch of uh, phenomena outside the ranch. This is not just Skinwalker Ranch that has this. This is a shadow figure taken off a security camera at a ranch near Skinwalker Ranch. And we have um, shadow people that appear in a lot of UFO experiences. A lot of experiencers have these. I actually asked one uh, wife of a, and a big experiencer whether she had seen shadow people. And she said, she laughed and said, do you want to see some photos? And she sent me a photo of the one of the many photos they had taken of shadow people in their house. One of the biggest things with um, Skinwalker Ranch is a ports. Now the story goes that they went there to look at UFOs, uh, but I maintain that it was the ports. It was the weird ports and manifestations that were going on there that actually interested the Defense Intelligence Agency even Jacques Vallée said in his journal, if you read his uh, books where he journals, 1996, 1997, uh, when Bigelow bought the ranch, Jacques Vallée said, uh, what are we going to do here? There are no UFOs. There's everything here but UFOs. And uh, what do we expect? What do we expect it to do? There really was no UFOs. A lot of the, the material that's going on there is at ports and manifestations. I actually wrote a book on it called Weird, the Paranormal World of uh, Ports and Manifestations. And that's basically what apports are. There are things that, that move around, they appear, they disappear. And all you can say when one of these things happens in your house is, wow, that's weird. It is really weird. It doesn't make any sense. Why would a phenomena do these kind of things except to get your attention and get you to explore reality? This is... Um, a bunch of apports that um, were produced by a physical medium. My assistant, Desta Barnaby, uh, filmed these. Uh, they came out of his mouth. Um, this physical medium had the water in his mouth. They took the, uh, the tape off his mouth. He spit the water out that had been put in before the seance began. And then he started to uh, almost like vomit these uh, uh, apports. And there was 1,800 of them in his mouth that they counted. And this was all filmed by my assistant as this was happening. And anybody, I've got a thousand bucks to anybody who thinks they can do this under the same control conditions. Absolutely unbelievable. And that's the whole thing is when you see this, you go, wow, how is this possible? If the world is the way people describe, uh, nothing paranormal, just a, a random meaningless universe, these kind of things would not be happening. Uh, these are some of the best supports I have in my book. Uh, there's piles of them, and they're all very weird stories. An experiencer out of Tucson, Arizona, comes back, and you can see on the left, 
she comes back to her, her uh, apartment and there in the middle of the bathroom floor is a pile of granular, it's uh, very granular dirt and has these white discs in it. And it's in the middle of the bathroom floor and uh, she takes a photo of it. And then later uh, she's at a restaurant and the same pile of dirt ends up under her chair in the restaurant. The other one is uh, you can see uh, the, the, the way the port thing, this phenomena works is it does things that are considered totally impossible. Like there's no way you could possibly do this. So they string her uh, iPod uh, earbud through the zipper. And you can see uh, they're basically just saying, let's see you uh, explain how this is done. It's to uh, shatter reality that uh, this could not possibly happen. And you start to explore uh, what's actually going on. And that's how they get you to change your opinion rather than arguing with you and trying to convince you that there's something. You get this experience and it shifts you in a moment. Here's um, a PowerPoint. This, I'm going to spend much time on this because uh, people don't really, uh, a lot of people don't do PowerPoint. So uh, I had an experience when I was working on the Apport book where this happened to me, where basically uh, my presentation as I was going to have it tested the night before I gave it, it had uh, uh, triple slides, double slides. Uh, it had uh, the one slide I was going to show was a lot of um, um, black helicopter photos have UFOs in them. I had one of those photos I was showing of a black helicopter with a UFO in the in the in the same photo. They flipped that one sideways, and these are things that are basically impossible. They 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 stretch slides, they they squish slides, uh, duplicated slides. Uh, and the audio, which everybody does PowerPoint knows that when you embed an audio on a slide, it does not come off the slide. It, it is embedded on there. And uh, not only was the no longer embedded, it was on a different slide. And the two slides where the embedded uh, audio was were missing. Uh, I would say about 50 or 60 slides out of 190 slides were affected. And in the end, I just told the guy who was running it just to... Um, uh, delete all the double, triple slides, and I would wing the presentation. Uh, was just floored me because these are things that are absolutely impossible. If you know how PowerPoint works, uh, this does not happen. He was actually saying to me, "Well, maybe you made a mistake." I actually went and reloaded the PowerPoint in my hotel room, and there was nothing wrong with it in the hotel room. And as soon as I got back to the stage, the second presentation, which I had copied, did the same thing. Metals is one thing that I say is a, a, an apport or a manifestation. A lot of people think it's a piece of a flying saucer, like some flying saucer comes here from a trillion galaxies away, and then little pieces start falling off the flying saucer. That's absurd. Uh, the, the better explanation for it is they want you to go, wow, what the heck is going on? And uh, they basically are dropping this material. Hell put off, I actually went to hell put off about this. Uh, who ran the SRI uh, remote viewing program in the 1970s and uh, talked to him. And I said, well, because he was analyzing this metal. And I said, well, you must know this is a port because you had this experience with Yuri Geller who was at the lab in 1972-73. And Edgar Mitchell was there. And uh, out of an uh, ice cream that Yuri, Yuri Geller was eating came a, a flight pin that uh, Edgar Mitchell had been missing for a number of years. And he wondered, how did you get this? And when they got back to the lab, uh, Yuri Geller was in a different room and the back half of that uh, pin fell in behind uh, Hal Putoff and uh, Edgar Mitchell. And then another piece of uh, Edgar Mitchell's lost material fell in the lab as well. So this is the idea that they dropped this stuff and there is never an explanation. It's like trying to figure out how this works and you're, you're scrambling around, you can't figure it out but it gets you the idea that reality is a little more complex than what you think it is. So I say the metal is being dropped. It's not falling off flying saucers. It's being done for a purpose and it's to get you to go wow and start to explore and get curious. Uh, I just bring this up as part of the metal research that's being done is why are there alien implants in um, experiencers? And I just point out that uh, Roger Lear who did the alien uh, removals uh, they had 250 patients, him and um, uh, Daryl Sims. And according to his book, he said uh, the 250, uh, all of them, all the suspect objects were on the left side of the body, which indicates to me that they aren't, the left side of the body is run by the right brain. 
So it appears that they're not really that interested in the left brain. They're more interested in the right intuitive brain. And that's why the implants are on the left side of the body. So they do these weird things of, of uh, you see these little patterns that don't make any sense, uh, but lead you to start to explore uh, what's actually going on. This is a piece that uh, Desta Barnaby found in a, a collection. We were going through a collection at uh, uh, University of Arizona, James McDonald's set. This is an object that came out of the sky in 1939. It was in there, it was not identified as an apport because uh, James McDonald wouldn't even have known what an apport was. It came out of the sky in 1939, embedded itself into a uh, garden. The guy saw it come down, it was red hot. He waited for it to cool down, pulled it out with a knife. And then later his daughter had this thing in Tucson. It's 99% pure uh, nickel. And uh, one of the experts on nickel in the United States said in 1939, there was no 99% pure nickel in any type of plane or object flying around in the sky. And it had a copper core to it. So again, it's a very bizarre sort of thing. Uh, no explanation, how does it work? It's a big mystery. And in the end, it's just to get you curious and get you trying to realize that uh, there's some weird stuff going on and uh, the world is not the way you think it is. This is the Bob White piece in the 1980s. It's been analyzed by 13 or 14 different labs. It rings like a bell. Uh, all sorts of analysis done on this. Again, total mystery. No, it came out of a UFO that had sort of landed, shot it out of the UFO and uh, Bob White picked this thing up after it had cooled down and had it analyzed uh, all over the place. No explanation, just this very bizarre uh, shattering of reality that this, this kind of stuff should not be happening. Even if you take a look at the, uh, the piece from uh, Ubatuba, this is uh, Jacques Vallée provided this material for uh, uh, the Stanford lab. Gary Nolan was looking at this and Gary Nolan points out that the same crash material uh, you have one piece where the isotopes are all messed up and the other part of the sample, uh, the isotopes are completely normal, which would indicate that the, uh, the intelligence behind the phenomena is just laughing, uh, doubled over laughing, uh, because that really gets you wondering, like, how can you have the same crash material and part of it is um, messed with in uh, un unbelievable isotope mixtures and the other one is completely normal. Here's uh, Chris Bletso, uh describing, this is metal that, that was dripping off an orb that was 11 feet up in the air, came flying down his driveway. And as it flew along, this metal was dripping off the orb. He scraped up all the metal off the uh, driveway and the stuff was actually uh, put together and analyzed. Again, very bizarre, no real explanation, no real uh, idea of why this is happening, but gets you uh, thinking. Um, here's a piece that's from what's called the gifting field, a piece of metal that was recovered. Uh, you can see um, in the, on the metal, uh, you can see a triangle with a circle on the, in the middle of it. Uh, my friend actually took this photo. He was the one that uh, uh, identified the gifting field and took Tim Taylor from NASA there. And um, then later, uh, Tim Taylor had this uh, medal given to Chris Bletso. You can see the same thing, the circle and the triangle. This is 24 karat gold, and it was uh, given to Chris Bletso. So triangles, circles, metal, all sorts of bizarre stuff that they are uh, basically throwing in front of us to catch our curiosity and get us going. Now back to Skinwalker Ranch, Skinwalker Ranch, uh, the reason Skinwalker Ranch became so famous was because of the airports and manifestations, because uh, this was all written up, all these weird things that were happening, all the uh, theory of wow stuff that was happening was written up in Hunt for the Skinwalker uh, by Colm Callagher and George Knapp. And that book ended up in the Middle East, in the, in the, uh, the, the, the zone in Iraq, and all the high level officials were reading the book and they were from DIA and they decided they were gonna go and investigate this. So the phenomena has now has the DIA interested in this whole thing and they're going to look at this bizarre stuff. So they send um, James Lekatsky to the site to uh, look at the site. Uh, um, Bob Aguilar was there. And while he's there, uh, this uh, object on the right appears and it's floating in this kitchen as uh, this top official from DIA is there looking at uh, investigating the, the Skinwalker Ranch. 
And the weird thing about it was it came off the, uh, it's similar to the object that was on tubular bells and that it was the music for the exorcist. And I can almost sort of hear, uh, Lekowski was the only one that saw this thing floating in the, in the kitchen. And it was almost like the phenomena was saying to Dr. Lekatsky, wow, welcome Dr. Lekatsky. We thought you'd never show up. And they put on this display for him. And now the DIA was dragged into it and they started to investigate it. And they started looking at all this kind of stuff. And this is how you, re you raise the zeitgeist of, the, of the, in the consciousness. So you have Skinwalker Ranch or you have Area 51 or you have the subject of UFOs. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or don't believe it. When people are discussing it, you can go to the deepest, darkest corners of the world and you can say UFO, you can say Area 51, and you can say Skinwalker Ranch, and everybody's going to know what you're talking about. It's just to raise the consciousness, to raise people's idea that this kind of stuff is going on. And, and after a while, the new generation comes along. Max Planck said, science advances one funeral at a time. The new generation is not offended with the idea. So if you go to young kids and you ask them about Skinwalker Ranch, Area 51 and UFOs, they'll say, yeah, it's all real. The skepticism is over and the, the zeitgeist, the consciousness changes and we move on and we realize that the universe is a different place than people thought it was 100 years ago. Again, we go back to Skinwalker Ranch and you get to these bizarre stories of a dog man smoking a cigarette at Skinwalker Ranch Why? and, and these blue orbs flying around. Why would you have a dog man standing there smoking a cigarette? Do you come a thousand uh, or a million or a trillion galaxies across to stand there as a dog man and smoke a cigarette? They do it because it's so totally bizarre. They want it absolutely bizarre that it makes no sense whatsoever so that people will repeat the story and tell the story and tell the story and tell the story and people start to investigate. That's why you have a dog man smoking a cigarette as far as I'm concerned. You have orbs that are reported at Skinwalker Ranch, and now it's all like this is big time stuff. They they got this orb, and uh, they 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 got a photo of it. Well, orbs are been in the the, the zeitgeist for a long time, and people say no, it's it's not. Uh, it, it's it's just dust. It's just uh, particles of, of of water and stuff like this. And I put it in this slide just to let you know that at Skinwalker Ranch, um, this is two guards reported this that they were told uh, they were to walk around the property and uh, with dogs and they weren't trained dogs. They were just ordinary dogs. And that if the dog were to go into a surrender position or if they were to feel something cold or feel something unusual, they were to stop immediately to take out cameras and start photographing. And they were to try and the, the, what they were trying to do is pick up these orb type objects on cameras. So they were to take the photographs, then they were to immediately take a urine sample. And that then when they went back, OSAP, who was running the investigation, uh, would analyze the urine. Now, we don't know what the urine samples or what they were actually looking for, but there's two guards that tell this story about uh, the fact that they were just to walk around and when something weird happened, to start taking photographs. So here you have orbs. Orbs are all over the place. Everybody knows about orbs. I would say there is at least one million photographs that I know of. They're totally being ignored at this point of time, but I'm sure that they are going to be uh, coming forward and uh, we're going to learn more about this and how these things connect. Uh, the other thing that uh, we knew already that hasn't hit the zeitgeist yet is that with orbs you also have uh, mists. This is a very granular mist. There are all sorts of mists we have uh, from the people that I've uh, put together on a group called Orbology on Facebook. There are as I said a million photographs, at least a million photographs. One friend of mine has 350,000 photos and uh, everybody if you see the pattern you'll see have you got orbs and then I'll say have you have you got any photographs with mists on them oh yeah I got those photographs they'll show you those photographs and then they'll show you uh, uh, beams which I'll show you in a second now the beams were caught at Skinwalker Ranch and they called it a, a, a light pillar I think they called it and they're all excited about this they got this thing well welcome to the real world this has been all over the place we've got thousands and thousands of photographs of this. This is the first one that I ever saw. This was uh, 2015. Chris Blotso sent it to me. I thought it was absolutely bizarre, uh, this uh, uh, beam of light. And so then I would ask people, have you got any beams? Have you, when you're doing orb photographing, do you get these beams? And of course people say, yeah, here's one. Uh, I believe this is from uh, Scotland. I think this may be Tress Blair. This is definitely Tress Blair from, from uh, Scotland. Uh, is an experiencer, uh, has lots of orb photographs, lots of beam photographs. Here's another beam photograph. Here's more beam photographs. We've got them from Tucson. 
Um, this one is trust Blair. You can see the big orb in the background, the beams, uh, twisted beams, and light doesn't go in a circle like that. Light goes in a straight line. Um, here's again, uh, beams, beams all over the world. This is, I think, is Macedonia. Uh, again, Macedonia. Aneta and Macedonia. And then you hear from Skinwalker Ranch, the whole thing about the blue orbs. And this has been turned into the fear of, uh, you know, the threat thing, these blue orbs and they're evil and they, they'll injure you and stay away from the blue orbs. Well, of course, when you um, have been doing orbs and you deal with the actual people who got the photographs and talk to the people around the world, you find out orbs are quite common. Blue orbs are all over the place. Here's one. Here's one from Australia. This person provided me with piles and piles and piles of blue orbs. Here's another one. Here's another one. Ron Johnson, experiencer out of uh, Utah. Uh, here's again, Australia. Here's Tress Blair, a blue one. Tress Blair again, a, a blue one. Here's um, uh, Hong Kong uh, from Stan Ho in Hong Kong, blue orbs. Uh, and there's actually, um, uh, if you go to Betty Andreasen, who had six books written about her UFO experiences, her abduction experiences, uh, she stated that she had a blue orb that she interacted with all the time, and it was her protector. It, it, it was uh, 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 protecting her. Here's a friend of mine. These are um, uh, beams as well uh, coming. This is my friend uh, Jim Schaefer, and in his bedroom, he would film these uh orbs and he actually had the one the blue orb that actually healed him like this this video is not playing i don't think but oh here it goes okay so here here's um he's filming he's getting these orbs you'll see it comes down comes out of his clothes this is a blue orb he's cured of cancer he has lymph node cancer here he does it in slow motion uh, he takes all the audio because he's yelling and screaming this happens in the middle of the night he films that it comes down between the two uh closets down into the clothes, you can see it coming down there now, and it goes to the the clothes, and then you can see it comes out of the clothes, and it moves up. Okay. Now the wild wow mutilations I'll do this because this was um, uh, part of Skinwalker Ranch, and people start to wonder like why would they do this kind of stuff? Uh, why would they? Uh, you know, mutilate cattle. Uh, what's the meaning of that? And when you start to look, it starts to make a little bit of sense. And I always said like to uh, Linda Howe and, and other researchers, I always talked about the things that they would do. There's no witnesses, there's no arrests. Uh, all mutilations occur in Christian countries. There's none in outside Christian countries. And there's uh, the holy Brahmin cows that from India, and there's millions of them around the world. There's not been a single mutilation. So I would say to all the mutilate, mutilation investigators um why do they take all the blood out of the cow why do they do these bizarre cuts uh why why do they take a heart uh and then shred the heart and yet leave the sack around the heart intact as if uh there's it seems impossible how did they get to the heart every drop of blood pulled out of the cow and then taking the cow when you've got the cow and you've mutilated the cow and it's on on board the ship and you fly off and then you come back and drop the cow from 100 feet up in the air into the farmer's front yard and this is the whole deal. I said, why would they do these bizarre kind of things? It's theory of wow, unless they have the bizarre cuts, the the pregnant cow with the with the cow the 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 fetus taken out without any incision or the brain taken out without any incision or whatever. Unless they do these very weird things, every last drop of blood, nobody's going to pay any attention to it. They want you to go, wow, how did they get the blood out of the cow? How did they shred the heart? How did they get the the brain out? and these bizarre things. And that's what they want you to do. They want you to investigate it. And then when you do, you start to realize there may be a pattern behind this. David Perkins, who has the biggest, I think, collection of um, cattle mutilation material in the United States started early on in, in, in the 1970s in this. Um, he basically came up with the theory that all cattle mutilations occur downwind and downstream from nuclear power activities. And uh, he put the pattern forward. And then when uh, Fukushima happened in 2011, Chris Bryant O'Brien, who works with him, uh, said to him, well, if your theory is right, we should start getting cattle mutilations in Oregon because there was no cattle mutilations on the West Coast. It was all uh, uh, east of the Rockies on the Plain States where the nuclear power activity, the nuclear bomb 
uh, stuff was going on and stuff like that up into Canada, uh, the wind with Alberta and Saskatchewan. And of course, as soon as Fukushima took uh, a week or two and suddenly Oregon started having cattle mutilations, which sort of gave the indication, a little sign as to uh, why you're having now cattle mutilations. And it may have to do with this nuclear thing. They're just sending this indirect signal. They want you to start to investigate and they want you to uh, look at it. And they do these very bizarre things to get your attention. The wild crop circles, same sort of thing. Why would you come across a, a trillion galaxies or a billion galaxies or even from 10 light years away to make crop circles? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It's, it's bizarre. And whatever you want to say about crop circles, people say, I don't believe, I believe that people are doing them or that uh, aliens are doing them, whatever. Everybody has the same sort of thing. It still wonders like, how could you possibly do this? It's, it's just, how do they, how do they make that thing that big? Uh, and what they've done is they've replaced this. Uh, people don't realize this, and I maintain that there really are no ground traces. And Stanton Friedman used to talk about the 4,000 ground traces where UFOs would land, they would leave little tripod marks or burn out crops and stuff like that. It hasn't happened for years. It hasn't happened for decades. It stopped, and, they, and the, 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 they went from that little pattern to the pattern of crop circles. So uh, when I was doing the investigation in Carmen in 1975, I think we had 10 ground traces. I can't even think of the last ground trace that was anywhere in, in terms of uh, this kind of stuff. They started as um, uh, very simple. Uh, let me go here first. This is one from the 1980s in the area where I am. This is my son when he was very young. This is a very simple circle. We had very simple circles and they moved to these very complex circles. They got more and more complex. And even uh, Colin Andrews talked about the fact that when it first happened in 82, they saw one type of pattern, then they saw another pattern. He was flying with uh, a pilot and he said, you know, it'd be interesting if they uh, were to put them together. And the next day they flew over and there was a crop circle with both the, both the uh, types of uh, circles combined, indicating that there was some conscious connection between uh, Colin Andrews and the people who were putting the crop circles down. So they become very complex, but a lot of people don't realize the whole crop circle thing started with a very bizarre uh, theory of wow event. It didn't just start with crop circles. It started with this. Colin Andrews has got a tape recorder, his first real real tape recorder, brand new. He's got it on a, a carpet of his room. He's about to test it. He's got the TV on. And as he pushes the button to test this new tape recorder he's got, suddenly the TV gets taken over and this message comes across about the new age of Aquarius and uh, taking care of the world. And this alien message just goes on for about five minutes. And he gets the entire thing on audio tape. That's how it starts. It starts with this very bizarre thing. Everybody's dragged into this thing and it's weird and people can deny it all they want, but that's how the whole thing starts. Colin Anders had it all on tape and this is part of the message. So crop circles are another thing. Um, uh, the wow of abductions. Abductions are a big uh, 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 event. And the question is, are there abductions? What's actually going on? Uh, if, you, if you take a look at um, the, the guy that talks about everything being interconnected, um, it's it's occurring. You you think you can see it on the top, but it's it's more it's more imp complex than that. Um, and one thing about abductions, people say this is a terrible thing, uh, but everybody here is probably into disclosure and wants the Canadian, the American and Canadian governments to disclose, tell us what's going on. Keep in mind, if there was no abductions, there would be no disclosure right now because the guy that's behind the whole thing with Congress now is Jim Semivan, a former high level CIA guy. And uh, he was known as was described to me in 2016 when I first discovered him as the big man in Washington. He was the guy who was behind it. And he went to the three letter agencies and said, you guys can't get it out. We're going to drop it. We're going to force disclosure. And if, if you have any problems, we're not going to disclose classified material. And that is Jim Semivan, who led the initiative that ha is happening now to get this thing in front of Congress. If it hadn't been for Jim Semivan, there would be no congressional investigations going on right now. Jim Semivan had the beings in his room. So if Jim Semivan hadn't been abducted or, or whatever happened in his room with these entities, would he have been interested enough to go to the three letter agencies and said, guess what? We're going to force this thing out. You guys can't do it. We're going to force out the UFO story. If it hadn't been for abductions, there would be no disclosure taking place in, in Washington right now. 
uh, the, the question of abductions is this is exactly what's going on. It's the whole idea of it, it, naive reality would say that people are being taken out of their beds at night and they're being worked on. That's naive reality. The, the whole principle is that there may be something behind it that's a little more complex. Jacques Vallée was the first to pick up on this pattern. He said we should recognize the universal as the universe as a substrate of mental reality of information structures. It's all about information structure and it's all simultaneous. He's saying this is it's more complex than what you think. And he references back to uh, uh, abduction type stories back hundreds of years ago, that this is just a replay. It's a re revisiting of the story in a different uh, light, almost like the 1896 UFO sightings where wooden ships because that's what people could understand at the time. And as the uh, intelligence um, ev evolves, the phenomena changes to adapt to whatever the mentality is of the people who are experiencing it. Um, Jacques Vallée talks about the fact that the government may be part of this um, experience, the UFO abductions in Latin America. He says he's got a document, uh, people haven't seen this yet, uh, confirming that the CIA was simulating UFO abductions. Uh, Edgar Mitchell, who uh, did the uh, free survey of 4,200 experiencers, was in charge of that. Uh, he talks about the abduction experience, perhaps a large part of the activity that's classified as UFO activity. Abductions and the whole host of this type of activity may well not be due to ET activity at all. I would suspect if any of it is due to ET activity, it's rather a small part, and a large part is due to human type activity earthly type activity in a very clandestine form. And this sort of surprises people that Edgar Mitchell really didn't buy into the abduction scenario as it was being portrayed of evil aliens grabbing people from their bedroom. Uh, Kit Green, who probably has more uh, uh, briefings on UFO, said no abductions ever. And people would say, well, how could he possibly say that? The thing is, there's an event taking place. The question is, what is the event? What are they actually doing? What is the uh, the intelligence actually trying to say in terms of this abduction? And are we interpreting based upon our uh, view of the world, how we see things in terms of good aliens, bad aliens? And uh, because as I've pointed out numerous times, if you look at the Mission Rama stuff, which is 25,000 people and thousands of experiences uh, with uh, beings and stuff like that, uh, they have no grace, they have no abductions, they have none of that kind of stuff. This is uh, uh, very unique. The Wilson leak document, which most people now are familiar with, at the very end, this is what they uh, they talk about. Uh, they talk about the fact that um, uh, Wilson, uh, Admiral Wilson was actually told uh, by a high level official who had gotten inside the program and knew what was going on, said UFOs are real. The so-called alien abductions are not real. And a lot of people put it in the, uh, that said, oh, he was just being misled. There was counterintelligence disinformation. No, there's a lot of people high up who talk about this thing. There's an event taking place, but it's not what you uh, really think is really going on. Um, this is uh, Philip Kensella, who uh, is one of the many people who have described the fact that uh, his experience was out of body. It was not, uh, he was going through walls and stuff like that. He had encounters with greys on board ships. But the fact that uh, he said, at one point I found myself coming back through the glass door when they put him back to, to, his, to his house. As to what happened, I felt myself being pulled back through my room and bang, I went back into my body. So it's a, they're talking about this out-of-body experience, which indicates abductions. There's an event, but it may be, not be the event people think it is. Uh, this is um, uh, Dr. Ingrid Honkala talking about her um, near-death experience as a two-year-old. She was an, a NASA scientist, a uh, very prominent PhD, and she talked about almost the same thing that UFO experiencers will describe. Wherever I put my mind, I could go. Time and space had vanished for me. I could be anywhere at any time. I saw a dog at the end of the street and was instantly there. Saw a tree and was instantly there. And this is what you'll see. I wrote a book uh, called uh, UFO Sky Pilots, which people describe this idea of three, being able to see in 360 degrees, instantaneously being able to go from one place to another, being in this uh, sort of a, a world where there's no time and space. It's basically almost like the same type of world that near-death experience people experience. Um, 
again, there's another uh, person talking about these experiences, abduction, near-death experience, out-of-body experience, fifth dimensional experiences. They all feel very much the same. Expanded awareness. I felt through my body as an advanced communication device. I could never get to across the people, how similar they are. And uh, we, Desta Barnaby and I put out a book called um, Contact Modalities in which we do reference the fact that it's all basically the same thing. It's just a different type of experience. And uh, whatever the phenomena is, is using different experiences for different people. And it's basically all the same thing. It's all consciousness and it's all uh, the same uh, ground of, of being type stuff. Um, George Knapp, again, talking about um, the, the, the Russians seeing different types of uh, people, their remote viewers uh, were contacts, in contacts with aliens, but they weren't like ours. This is one of the more bizarre things if you actually believe that that um, aliens are abducting people and working on them with tables and that they came here from other planets or whatever. Uh, I've done a lot of work on uh, the contact modality of uh, uh, psychedelics and the DMT experiment. I had a friend of mine who is one of many who uh, contacted me, said, Grant, I had a, 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 an abduction experience last night. I did DMT and it was, it was a classic abduction experience. It was on a table. Uh, they were working on his brain and uh, he could see there was beings around the table. He couldn't see their heads, but he could see their arms. And he said it was a classic abduction experience. Half of all the people who do DMT will in engage uh, entities in this experience. And I think one quarter of them will have the abduction type experience being explored or being on a table and stuff like that. So again, it gets to your question, the theory of wow is what's really going on. These people are having these experiences and the curiosity, the more you look at it, the more you realize that the uh, naive reality is not the way it is. It's much more complex than what it would appear on the surface. 340 detailed DMT trip reports found 66% of experiences recounting interacting with independent existing entities while under the influence of the drug. 